Hi, I'm Matt Muller with MovieWeb. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. It's a pleasure to speak with you, Matt. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you're one of the few directors who can really incorporate emotion into horror in a way that's not maudlin or trite, in a way that's really powerful. Uh, you just make banger after banger. You're, you're, you know, and it's great to see this novella. Um, it's surprising that you hadn't really written much before. I guess not that surprising. Very different mediums. But I was telling Matthew Lillard that this sort of what he's doing with spirits is very sort of cinematic in a way and how collaborative it is bringing all these artisans together uh, to create this one thing. And you're like the, the screenwriter for this project. Um, where did the idea come from originally? Well, I, Matt approached me with it. We were shooting, um, we had worked together on Life of Chuck and immediately, I, I've just, I loved Matt Lillard the day I met him. I just loved the guy. Um, I mean, it's impossible not to, I think. And so we had worked together on Life of Chuck and had a great time. And we were shooting uh, this little <laughs> this little web series um, called Grave Conversations about caskets. And we were on set at the same time. And he approached me then and said, hey, I have this company. It's called Macabre Spirits. This is what we're doing. You know, this is kind of the whole concept of it. And we're going to release you know, these high end, very limited um, bottles of of uh, of spirits that'll come with a short story. And he knows that I'm sober. I, I don't drink. Uh, and he said, I know I know that isn't really your thing, but is is that something you'd ever be interested in contributing some some writing for? And I said, oh, sure. Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't begrudge anyone else who drinks. I, I just... I, uh, it was, it was not a good match in my life for me, but I very much remember my days of collecting fine and limited spirits and wine and, and other things like that. And I was like, oh, I'd be, I'd be thrilled to be part of it and to just be part of a project with Lillard, who I just adore. Um, so he pitched me on it then. I said yes on the spot. Um, I had no idea what I would write about. Uh, and it was supposed to just be a short little story. And uh, I sat down with no clear idea of, of a topic or a storyline. I came up with a few log lines for a couple of options for him and sent them to him. He responded to this one. Uh, and I didn't even really know where the story would go, but I, I sat and started working on it. And I've heard writers talk about, a, or, or any artist talk about a project that takes on a life of its own. And I've used that description before without really understanding it until now where like this this story just ran away from me it it I, I kept texting Matt and saying okay I know you wanted 10,000 words it's going to be 12 or it's going to be 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 I don't know what's going to happen dude I just can't stop and and I was so delighted while I worked on it and I had no idea where it was going and in just the faintest kind of sense of a structure for it and every page felt like a discovery. And, and I just never had that experience creatively before. It was so fun that finally I sent him the story feeling very embarrassed. And I said, I, I think I've, I, I don't know if you can even use this. I don't know if you guys are, are planning to print something this long to include with your bottle, but if you like it, here it is. And I, I apologize <laughs> for taking so long. Um, and uh, and he really really loved it and and it's it's one of the coolest projects I've been a part of and as I saw the other elements come in as I saw the the design of the bottle itself and these incredible paintings that that came with it that looked like uh, they were glowing like the the incredible artistry of of how she treats light I I was just like what a gift Matthew Lillard gave me by asking me to be part of this. And I had no idea at the time kind of just what a profound gift it really was. Um, I just thought it would be a fun little thing I'd spend an afternoon doing for a friend. And it has turned out to be one of the coolest creative endeavors I've gotten to be a part of maybe in my career. Um, I'm so excited to, to get my hands on the bottle and to display it 
And I'm so excited for people to read the story. And I've even started to think about sometime down the line, whether I could adapt it into a movie and, and keep it going. Cause I, I just love the, the story so much. And then if that's a cool chance to again, collaborate with Matthew Lillard in another cool way, uh, it would just be a really neat ending to this whole thing. But, um, but that's where it came from. And it really, uh, it really was a, a total delight um, and a very unexpected one. Yeah, I'd love to see uh, Matthew playing Frankie. Uh, I, I love the story. It was uh, uh, the novella. It reminds me, I, I kept thinking like Ecclesiastes written by a Satanist. Uh, <laughs> just, That's uh, great. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and it really speaks to this urge for more and more. Uh, and I don't know if that's innate in the human condition or uh, a byproduct of capitalism or if it's just exacerbated by materialism and capitalism. But is is that sort of uh, I mean, you speak of just not really knowing where you're going while writing it and just it, it had a life of its own, which I relate to a lot. But was there like a, a, a inciting idea? Was it your own personal experience with uh drinking and fine wines or was it uh uh the sort of uh sarcasm or mocking the wine snobbish culture or was it this idea for like more and more uh, uh unceasingly yeah kind of all of that i the the endless gluttony of capitalism has been on my mind for for years and we got to explore it to some extent in the fall of the house of usher but that's never left me as a point of fascination. In this one, I started from a place of thinking about, you know, collect collecting fine spirits because that was their whole hook for the company. And it took me back very quickly to my days of wine tasting. It took me back to the days where I would spend way more money than I could afford to spend to acquire a certain bottle of wine. Um, and I was an alcoholic, so I was drinking to get drunk. And while a lot of people around me seemed to really have an academic and artistic appreciation of the wine, I was faking it the entire time. Um, and if I was brutally honest with myself, the next morning for me was always just like, I couldn't taste the difference between the $200 bottle of wine and the $5 bottle of wine. I can't taste the difference. I just wanted the alcohol. And um, so that's always been something looking back at that period of my life that's in the foreground for me. Um, and again, that that isn't meant to be a, a takedown of the entire wine tasting world. It was more a confession of my own kind of hypocrisy uh, within it. Um, but I do think that there is an endless hunger to capitalistic thinking that goes beyond even possessions and goes beyond even the accumulation of things that that are either wildly overvalued or have no no discernible way to measure value like an experience you know that when i think of the people who will pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to have a seat on on a rocket ship, you know, that that briefly orbits the planet. And it's like, God, that would be an amazing experience. But you think about the price tag and you think about the people who could drop what another family would pay to own a home to have this fleeting experience. You know, it, it, it raises a lot of really interesting questions to me uh, about priorities and about waste and about the illusion of value. Um, and about how much do we really need? How much do we really need to consume? And at what point is that consumption homicidal? You know, at, at what point do our appetites cost lives? Yeah. Um, our appetite for a new iPhone can cost a life on the other side of the world. And just because we're not there in the immediate moment, does that mean we're not at all culpable? You know, these are these are the questions that come with with a society like ours and, and, yeah. and with a global economy like ours. So all this stuff swirls around while, while I'm writing. Um, and it felt like, oh, this is a great 
this is a rare chance to talk about those things in a way that, you know, I didn't get to finish talking about in, in Usher and some of the other projects. Um, but in this case, because you're not writing for the screen and you can just get these ideas directly onto the page in a very stream of consciousness way, it really opened a floodgate for me. It made it possible to put a lot of ideas that were on my mind on the page, but also to try to wrap them up in something that was very visceral uh, and kind of wickedly fun for me at the same time. But sorry, that's a yeah. very rambling answer to your question. No, no, that's great. And I think in that innate contradiction of capitalism, there is a Lovecraftian horror in that it is uh, autophagous or autophagous. It's self-eating, it's self-cannibalizing. And there's something disgusting at the end of that that's coming and i wanted to talk to you you know in october for spooky season but apparently the horrors never end in this hell world um would you make a political horror film at all do you think the political climate of the next four years or the last eight years will inspire you to make something much more directly in in tandem with this interest you have with capitalism right now Yes, I do. Um, I wish today that I had done more of that sooner. Not that I imagine it would have made a difference. I don't. But um, I think one of the amazing powers of the genre is that we can have these kind of conversations. We can raise these ideas in a forum that reaches a huge number of people and that gets the idea onto the table through this delivery system of, of an entertaining genre where if you want to tell a story about racism in America, you can make that movie. You can tell that story and the people that seek it out either agree with you going in or are curious to hear that conversation going in. But if you make night of the living dead, the people coming in want to see a zombie movie and they get it and it's scary and it's great. And when they're driving home, realizing they're thinking about racism in America because of where that story went and how it ended, that's the beauty of genre. I think the fall of the House of Usher was the first time that I felt like I got overtly political in my storytelling. And I felt like I had something to say um, that was important, whether people would agree with it or not. Uh, I do have that hunger to do more of that. This story has a fair amount of that in it. Um, and I find it to be exhilarating and make me feel like I'm working on something with substance um, and not just trying to figure out how to scare somebody or how to make somebody cry. Or, you know, I, I've gotten to explore a lot of things in my work that are important to me, whether it's trauma, family, grief, mortality, religion, you know, I think, well, I guess, yeah, Midnight Mass was also overtly political now that I mention it, um, but was way more about the politics of faith and about religion, the corruption of organized religion. Alcohol as well. And alcohol. I've always had a lot to say about alcohol, whether I knew it or not. Um, it's funny for me looking back at older projects before I was sober and realizing that I was dealing with it then and didn't didn't see it until later. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I do hope, especially in today's climate, <laughs> it, it, it feels impossible to stay quiet today. Yeah. And even if you do intentionally with the climate, there's going to be, uh, it might be projected onto you anyway, of uh, just because of the climate. Yeah. Hey, oh gosh, I love talking to you. I want to talk about this so much more. I only have two minutes, unfortunately. Oh, we so can, I, I can, I've got a, some extras. Do we have any? We don't have anybody behind you, do we, Kelly? Do we have anybody after this? No. If you want to keep going, that's yeah, okay. Let's, let's, let, yeah, we can. Yeah, we can go longer. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. I um I did want to touch on just 
your relationship with Stephen King uh, throughout your career. Um, I mean, you and Matthew Lillard worked on Life of Chuck, and that was so huge at TIFF. Our critic loved it. Uh, and I hear you're involved with a Carrie TV series, which I think is perfect for you because, honestly, I, I feel like that might be his saddest. <laughs> his, yeah. One of his saddest pieces. It's uh, a very heart-aching uh, painful story. Why did you go back to Carrie? What interests you about adapting that? And why a TV series? Well, well for TV, you know, it initially started as a conversation uh, that Amazon initiated. Um, and they said, hey, would you have interest in, in Carrie? And I had to think about it because my first instinct is always, why? It's been done perfectly by De Palma. You know, it's, it's then been done three other times <laughs> after the fact. Why do it again? But to your point about the politics of today, Carrie White is a story about high school violence and bullying. And that feels immediate and, and important today. Uh, unfortunately, even more kind of sharply relevant than I think it was when he wrote it. Um, so there felt like a chance for some true modernization beyond just changing the time period and to use it to talk about the issues that affect high school kids in America today. You know, Carrie White walking through a metal detector is interesting to me. Carrie and, White was social media. <laughs> yeah, Carrie White was social media. The 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 iconic scene in, in the locker room is very different when people have phones in their hands, you know, and... Um, and so that was the first germ of an idea where it was like, really, oh, well, there's, there is room to, there is room for this to actually have a lot to say that's very relevant. And I can't spoil the, the changes that we made in order to kind of find a story that felt like it needed to be told, but we made, we made some pretty substantial changes. And when I brought it to Stephen King, because that's the other side of this, if Steve says, no, he doesn't want to see it happen, we're not going to do it. You know, um, I'm, I'm not about to not about to do that in that relationship. And and so when I mentioned it to him and said, what do you think about Carrie for TV? And he said, well, why? She's she's no, leave her alone. It's, it's it's she's she's good. She's done. I'd rather we focus on, on other things. And when I sent him kind of the the layout of how I saw it could work, he really liked it. And he came back and said, actually, yes, I think this is interesting. And I think this could be really relevant and could be really exciting. And so that was when I said, okay, yeah, we should do this. Um, I can't talk more about it other than um, we're in the writer's room. We're having a great time. And I think we're going to tell a story that will be surprising and, uh, and impactful, very relevant to our modern society and to issues in our country. And I think more than anything about my, my oldest son is 14 years old. And I, I look at him as I'm working on this story and, and, and think it's important for, for his generation. I, I think there'll be something in there that, that I hope will be useful to them in this world. But, um, but yeah, it's gonna, it's, I'm, I'm really glad we're doing it. I'm having a blast, but it, it was a surprise to me as well that it, it emerged as a priority because my initial reaction was why do it? Uh, which I, in fairness, I had the same reaction to um, when we first talked around, uh, talked about adapting the turn of the screw um, for Bly Manor. It's just like, it's been done dozens of times. Like that thing is just worn out. Why, why approach it? And we found an approach that made it feel like, yes, absolutely. This is a story worth telling. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think, I think it's going to be very, uh, very interesting for people. And I think it'll be surprising. Yeah. I remember reading Carrie when I was in middle school, vicious bullying then. Uh, and it was, I mean, there's the wish fulfillment revenge fantasy, but it's also just the empathy, uh, the feeling of being seen and like, you know, this was happening 50 years ago and, you know, um, it's it's okay there's other people uh yeah. so i'm sure your show will be a comfort to a, a lot of people as well um well finally because you've been very generous i don't want to take more of your time but do you think there's a uh 
Uh, would you recommend a underrated Stephen King film that you think people don't give enough love to anyone? Is there one oh. out there for you? I mean, my God, yeah. Um, you know what jumped immediately to my mind uh, is The Night Flyer with Miguel Ferrer. Uh, is, a, is a really good movie that I don't think gets gets the appreciation that it deserves. I mean, I think with the books, it's easier to point at ones where it's like, oh, that that book doesn't get the love. Like, I always wonder where the where the swell of love is for Revival, which is one of my favorites of his of his books, um, or Hearts in Atlantis, which I think is just an incredible, incredible yeah. piece of work. But on the movies, um, yeah, The Night Flyer, uh, I think, is underappreciated. And I think uh, the storytelling is great. The ending is phenomenal. Miguel Ferrer is is wonderful in the role, uh, and it just doesn't get the love it it should get. Um, you know, I think a lot of the others that because everybody, of course, I can't say like <laughs> Shawshank, Stand by Me, Green Mile, Misery, like Carrie don't get the love. They do. They get the love. Um, Christine is one I find that that whenever I revisit, I'm I'm always glad I did. That's one where I'm like, oh yeah, that one really worked. Uh, and that you don't hear that brought up enough. I think Cronenberg's The Dead Zone feels this week uh, feels a lot more <laughs> impactful than it might have um, it might have last week. But that's one. Whenever I revisit it, I'm like, what a beautiful piece of work that was, and. Um, and yeah, it, it doesn't end up in kind of the upper echelon of the of the movies people bring up right away. I could talk about this all day. Yeah, uh, I, I rewatched yeah. The Dead Zone two weeks ago or so uh, as part of the Cronenberg Fest, and I had forgotten about the whole Martin Sheen. I mean, that's such a big part of it, but I'd forgotten about it. And it's uh, yeah, it was it was kind of eerie watching that. Um, there's a there's an amazing. Um, hopelessness in that story that that uh th this faded kind of um sadness to it i i i got to do a commentary track for that with uh eric vespi and scott wampler last year um and and that was the last time i saw the movie and i remember the three of us watching that for that commentary track just kind of all being like why isn't this more celebrated like why why aren't we kind of trumpeting the merits of of this movie from the rooftops. There's so much in it that's so amazing. But the Martin Sheen stuff really punches. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, I, I saw a great little Facebook meme of a friend who just put up current mood and it's the it's a picture of of walking at the rally, you know, and it's like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Um, but yeah, so if I, I'd say if, if if people are looking to dive into underappreciated King, yeah, get your hands on do Dead Zone, do uh, do the Night Flyer. Oh, you know what else I'd put up? I'd put on there. Um, it's hard to find, but the limited series Storm of the Century is so good, and yeah. no, not nearly enough people have appreciated it and seen it, and and I find myself evangelizing about it all the time. And then you can't find it anywhere. It's like impossible to track down. But Storm of the Centuries, I think my favorite of the miniseries. And yeah, that's something. we wrote a, an article about it, why it's the most underrated is Stephen King retweeted it. Um, it's a uh, it it's great. I think it's on YouTube. But yeah, uh, there needs to be a, a nice 4K of that. <laughs> you want to see something cool? Hold on. Yeah, um, please. <laughs> right back. Um, Check this out. So this is actually it. So it's the real one. It's a real one. Yeah. Oh wow! It, it showed up at the bottom of a prop auction last year, and it was just kind of tucked in the back. And I, I just grabbed it because I was you like, saw that's, it. "Of course, he's awesome. Uh, yeah. That's great." Uh. But yeah, th there needs a, to be a 4K of that. I think that one needs. That one needs to be reappraised. It's really special solid. edition. Well, I hope you get to do the commentary track on that as well. <laughs> oh, that'd be fun. Um, I'd do it in a heartbeat.
Yeah, yeah. likewise. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to discuss all of this. Congrats. I love the novella. I'm looking forward to everything in the pipeline, of course. So, <laughs> oh, Thank you so much. And, and you have a great rest of the day.